Whether it's the house and enhancement chip, add multiplayer features, or just a different coat of paint, the Sega Genesis slash Mega Drive is no stranger to cartridge variations. But there's one shell with a backstory that's a bit more controversial and interesting than all the rest. EA's Yellow Tap Carts. More than just a marketing gimmick, these cartridges are the end product of the time that EA, then a plucky underdog in the world of console gaming, bent Sega to their will by reverse engineering their 16-bit console. And I wasn't that happy with the trend that had been started by Nintendo with the very draconian licensing models yeah. where they're keeping a lot of the revenue and they're inhibiting uh, developer freedom and making the cost too high. And I thought, you know, uh, we don't have to enter into a conventional license agreement with Sega. We, we can reverse engineer the machine. From both companies' strong arm tactics, Sega's legal threats to EA's ingenuity, this is a story behind Electronic Arts Yellow Tab Sega cartridges. To say that EA is a juggernaut in today's world of gaming is an understatement. EA owns numerous studios, has a portfolio full of popular IPs and franchises, and has forecasted that they will bring in $5.63 billion in revenue for the 2021 fiscal year. But before Electronic Arts became the behemoth that they are today, they were a young upstart PC game publisher founded by Trip Hawkins in 1982. In 1985, EA underestimated the potential of the NES when it launched in North America, and instead opted to stick to their PC game business. However, by 1988, Electronic Arts realized that it was vital for the company's future to enter the realm of cartridge-based home consoles. EA approached Nintendo, but balked at their restrictive licensing agreement for third-party developers. Nintendo required third-party developers to purchase expensive dev kits from them, charge high royalty fees for each game sold, and controlled most aspects of production. As one of EA's earliest executives, Bing Gordon, recalled, wait, we spend all this time and we build a game, but we don't know if we can bring it to market? They said, that's right. And if we decide to bring it to market, we manufacture it and we'll tell you how many we'll build. You pay us half the cost, and then we manufacture it when we feel like it. When it's done in Japan, you pay the second half of the cost and we release it and you figure out how you want to ship it. There was, however, another option besides Nintendo. In 1988, Sega released the now legendary Sega Genesis slash Mega Drive in Japan, with the North American release set to follow the next year. As a distant number two to Nintendo, EA expected to find in Sega a company eager to attract third-party publishers and developers through more generous licensing agreements than Nintendo. Instead, Sega greeted EA with terms almost identical to Nintendo's. Sega wanted to control the manufacturing of cartridges, dictate how many games a developer could release, and of course, charge a big royalty fee for each cartridge sold. This may sound strange, but at the time, EA was essentially a punk rock label of sorts in the world of PC games. They were a publisher that treated their game developers with more than just respect. EA treated them like rock stars, referring to them as artists, and even included music album style photo credits of their game's programmers. I'm noticing these software developers that were doing the first generation bitmap graphics and you know, WYSIWYG apps and mm -hmm. graphics and so on. And I was really, these, these guys are really creative and they've got an artistic temperament. And if they were making music or books or <laughs> movies, there's a certain way they would be treated mm -hmm. and managed and how their products would get brought to market and how their personalities would be part of the story of the products. Right. So yeah, nobody's ever done that with technology. Nobody's ever done that with engineers. Nobody's ever done that with games. Uh, I'm gonna do that. Nintendo and Sega's requirements went against the very principles that EA founder Trip Hawkins had based his company on. Trip Hawkins and by extension EA were very supportive of smaller third-party developers as part of their business model, something that Trip Hawkins would continue to do when he later launched 3DO. Although Sega needed third-party developers, Sega of America President Mike Katz wouldn't budge during negotiations. Needless to say, Trip Hawkins refused to agree to Sega's terms, and after a year of fruitless negotiations, an executive from Sega sarcastically told EA exec Bing Gordon that if they wanted a better deal, they would just have to reverse engineer the Genesis. But what Sega meant as an ultimatum to accept their deal or move on, Electronic Arts took as a challenge. In 1989, EA began work on a clean room reverse engineering of the Sega Genesis. EA had one team of engineers study, poke, prod, disassemble, do whatever they wanted to do to the Genesis in order to figure out how it worked. This dirty team 
would then write instructions explaining how the different parts of the hardware work without using any proprietary code. And then those instructions would be passed on to the clean team, who then had to figure out how to piece it all together. This approach mirrored Compaq's clean room method for reverse engineering IBM's BIOS for their IBM compatibles. In other words, the legality of what EA was doing had already been established. EA assigned the task of reverse engineering the Genesis to Steve Hayes and Jim Nichols. There really isn't a lot of information regarding the clean team's technical process, but Jim Nichols is often credited with figuring out the most significant aspects of EA's reverse engineering efforts. And notably Jim Nichols, because he did the most breakthrough work in figuring out how the Genesis worked. And Steve Hayes is a, another one, uh, also known as Shays. So these guys were amazing heroes that just literally entered a desert uh, that no human being had ever crossed and made it all the way to the other side. And it took like a year. After Hayes' initial success, EA built their own Sega Genesis development tools and started to work on porting some of their PC games. Jim Nichols and Kevin McGrath, who worked on reverse engineering the NES for Electronic Arts, began working on a Genesis port of the PC game Populous, a game that would come to represent the dawning of a new era for Electronic Arts. Though its importance to the industry isn't quite what it used to be, for many years the Consumer Electronics Show was the premier destination for software and electronics companies to show off their latest and greatest products. The 1990 Summer Consumer Electronics Show, also known as CES, was held in Chicago in June of the same year, and Sega had made preparations for their booth to have a major presence there. EA, however, had also rented booth space and was ready to make a big splash of their own. If you try to look up what happened next, you're bound to find a few different versions of a dramatic but inaccurate story about how the day before CES, Trip Hawkins met with Sega officials, pulled out a copy of Populous, jammed it into a Genesis, and shocked Sega by revealing that EA had reverse engineered their console. Some articles even say that Trip threatened to start his own third-party licensing agreement for other companies if Sega didn't give them a sweetheart deal. It makes for a great story, but that's not exactly what happened. EA did approach some of the developers that they worked with and offered to let them use their Genesis development tools to create titles that EA would then publish and distribute. But EA didn't use this to get leverage over Sega. They didn't need to. Sega began to hear that we were having some of these conversations and they were really worried that I might just tour a third party licensing program because why would anybody get a license from Sega and overpay for it and be agreeing to a bunch of limitations and contract when they could get a much more open free license from me that would be actually in fact a lot cheaper. The irony about this was that what Sega didn't know at that time was that uh, nobody was interested. There was no interest. Everybody was terrified of getting sued by Sega. <laughs> so they just, they just didn't want to do it. And I knew that, but I guess Sega didn't, didn't know that. So what actually happened? As I said earlier, EA had booked a booth at CES and planned to show off several games. Sega had heard that EA reverse engineered their console, but they didn't know that EA was planning on using CES to show off a bunch of their upcoming unlicensed Genesis titles. One month before CES, Trip Hawkins decided that the responsible and professional thing to do was to reach out to Sega one last time and to let them know about their intentions and to see if there was a way to work together. And we've planned all this to go forward and do this without a license. And I just knew uh, uh, that as a conscious, responsible CEO of a public company, I really ought to go talk to Sega before we blindsided them at the show and see if we could be partners with them instead of starting a war. I went over to Sega and you know, guys like Mike Katz were there and David Rosen was there. And we, we started that conversation again, that was uh, in early May. And it uh, began to become clear to me that there was a possibility of working something out. And we, we worked on it in May before we all went to Chicago. Trip Hawkins did meet with Sega's lawyer the day before CES, but it was to hammer out some small details and sign paperwork. According to Trip, the meeting lasted into the evening, but the deal was already practically done heading into it. In the book, The Ultimate History of Video Games, Trip Hawkins is quoted as saying, we signed a very unusual and much more enlightened license agreement with Sega. Among other things, we had the right to make as many titles as we wanted. We could approve our own titles, 
there was not this sort of oppressive restriction on our rights of expression, and of course, the royalty fees were a lot more reasonable. We had more direct control over manufacturing. And that more direct control over manufacturing is where EA's yellow tab Sega Genesis cards come in. EA's Chief Creative Officer Ben Gordon and Vice President of Marketing Services Nancy Fong took advantage of the special licensing agreement and created the yellow tab cartridges as a way to make EA's cards stand out from the other Genesis titles. Nancy Fogg is one of EA's earliest employees and 37 years later, she is still working there. Within a month of CES, EA released its first two Sega Genesis games, Budokan the Martial Spirit and Populous, both of which featured the now iconic yellow tab cartridges. Toward the end of the year, EA released John Madden Football for the Genesis, which would go on to sell over 400,000 copies. The importance of EA reverse engineering the Genesis cannot be understated. In the first three years of their deal with Sega, EA saved $35 million in fees that they would have had to fork over to Sega under a traditional licensing agreement. But beyond saving money, it's possible EA wouldn't even be around today were it not for the reverse engineering of the Sega Genesis. As Bing Gordon put it, we reverse engineered the electronics in a clean room environment because Sega wouldn't give us license terms that we could live with. If this had not worked and the games hadn't sold, EA would probably have gone the way of early computer game leaders like Broderbund and Sierra. It was a truly bet the company decision. While EA's unique cartridges were a part of a marketing strategy, they also represent much more than that. EA and Trip Hawkins spent a year trying to negotiate with Sega to no avail. Hawkins pressed forward by having EA reverse engineer the Genesis, and when he reached out to Sega's David Rosen the month before CES, Rosen threatened to sue EA. Trip Hawkins again pressed forward, insisted on a meeting with Sega, and proceeded to get everything he wanted from them. These cartridges are a badge of honor for Trip Hawkins. In an interview with Vintage Computing and Gaming, Trip said it was his greatest triumph at EA. I believe the biggest real triumph was my decision to aggressively pivot to the Sega Genesis and to make a bigger commitment by reverse engineering it. This was an episode similar to Lawrence of Arabia, taking Aqaba after crossing the uncrossable Nefa Desert. It took tremendous courage, leadership, determination, and execution, and I will never forget what brave souls like my hero Jim Nichols joined us on that perilous journey. What did you and your friends think these yellow tabs were for when you were growing up? Did you, like many others, think that it had some kind of functional reason for being there? Or did you know that they were due to the most handsome man in 90s gaming relentless pursuit of a better licensing deal? Let me know in the comments below and I'll reply with a comment reverse engineering what you really meant. A big thank you to Zadok Payet of Retro Game Living Room and Genovi for allowing me to use excerpts from their interview with Trip Hawkins in this video. They both have great channels that I recommend subscribing to and are linked in the description and pinned comment down below. If you'd like to support the channel monetarily, you can do so on Patreon at patreon.com forward slash wrestlingwithgaming, or to keep up on what's happening with the channel, follow me on Twitter at WrestlesGaming. But most of all, thank you for watching. The month before CES, Rosen threatened to sue Sega. Hawkins pressed forward by having EA reverse engineer the Genesis, and when he reached out 